So now we're ready to talk about a vaccine. How do we stimulate our bodies to make these antibody proteins? We do that with a vaccine. And a vaccine, uh, there, there are many different forms that a vaccine has taken over the years. In the very early days, <laughs> uh, way back when they were developing a vaccine for polio virus, they were simply taking a polio virus and they were inactivating it. And then this, they referred to this as an attenuated virus. So they were, they were isolating the virus, which was very infectious at that time, but then they would treat that virus in such a way that it could no longer infect you, but that the proteins on the surface of the virus, which you wanted to create an antibody to recognize that, the proteins were still there. So they just inoculated you with an attenuated virus that didn't make you sick, but elicited the antibody response. Now, you can imagine that was that's kind of dangerous because what if you attenuated 99% of the infectivity of the virus? You were still, everyone always worried about the risk of you not getting a fully inactivated virus in your inoculation. We now have the advantage of being able to to determine the exact three-dimensional structure of these proteins that are on the surface of a virus. And this is a model of the spike protein. Uh, we've looked at this before. There are three subunits here. Uh, we've displayed two of them as surfaces. And the third one, the blue subunit here, dark blue, light blue, this is, uh, this is the third subunit of the spike protein. And this is the part down here that's embedded in the viral membrane. So this is, this is the surface that's exposed to the environment here. And what we talked about before is this little blue, light blue domain here is different than the other, the same domain from the other two subunits, and it's flipped sort of up. The other two are down, this one is up. So this is a confirmation that is thought to be involved in the binding to that ACE2 receptor on the surface of our cells. So this represents a really good epitope. We'd like to create antibodies that would bind to different parts of this receptor binding domain. Or other people might say, think that uh, if we could create an antibody that would bind down here, we might somehow inactivate this process, or, or you know, any number of other places on this spike protein. So people are, different, different groups are focused on different parts of this, this protein. Although I think everyone is betting that this is the domain right here, this receptor binding domain that uh, will ultimately true, prove to be the best target. So how do you make a vaccine then? that will elicit antibodies to that. Let's just make a little, a little epitope, a piece of the spike protein. And we will somehow incorporate that into the vaccine. So that gets uh, delivered in a shot, like a flu shot. And then your body will recognize that little protein, that piece of the protein as a foreign material as an antigen, and it will create antibodies that will bind to this. You can even introduce a super vaccine by, by taking a nanosphere of some sort, and you might attach 10 or 20 or 50 copies of this little receptor binding domain to a little, a little microsphere, nanosphere. And then you really concentrate the presence of this antigen. So you might elicit an even stronger normal immune response to this particular protein. And you don't have to think simply of producing the protein. You can actually, uh, people are working on what they call DNA vaccines or RNA vaccines. The DNA vaccine is just a double-stranded piece of DNA whose sequence encodes this protein. So that DNA is, is inoculated into you, and then you transcribe that into messenger RNA, and you translate that into this protein. Or some people say, why mess with double-stranded DNA, let's just go with an RNA vaccine. So you create a messenger RNA that is ribosome-ready, and you introduce that, that ribosome-ready mRNA into, into your bloodstream via an inoculation, and ultimately it will be translated into a little piece of protein, uh, which is then uh, 
been recognized as foreign and you make antibodies to it. Creating a vaccine takes a long time. Now, why does it take a long time? Well, you have to go through three phases of clinical trials because you would think that just creating a little fragment of a protein like this would not cause any harm. But that's not necessarily true. So this little protein, this little piece of a protein, may have some unintended consequences. If you're going to start inoculating this foreign protein into lots and lots of people, you want to make darn sure that it's, uh, it's not going to cause any harm. So phase one clinical trial is simply a small-scale test to make sure that it's not, uh, it's not, it's not hurting people. Uh, and then that moves on to phase two, which is referred to as sort of an efficacy trial. You want to make sure that it has then some beneficial effects. So you have to have, if you listen to Tony Fauci, he'll talk about double-blind, randomized control studies. So you have good controls over here, and, and the question is simply, does this help to protect people from coronavirus? And then, if it passes both phase one and phase two, you get to phase three, which is a very large-scale trial in which you try it on lots and lots of people, as broad a population as possible, to see how good of a vaccine it may be. And the good news, the bad news is that it takes some time to do that. Usually people say a year to a year and a half. I think you're going to see a really accelerated effort to come up with a coronavirus vaccine. But I think we'll set a new record for how quickly we come up with a vaccine. And then the other thing I would say is that we're probably, we hope, I hope, we don't come up with just a vaccine. I hope we come up with a number of vaccines. Uh, I know there are many, many, maybe as many as 50 different vaccine programs, research groups, academic groups, as well as pharmaceutical companies, NIH. Lots of different people are trying to come up with a vaccine. And the hope is that one of these, not just one, one of these, but several of these, maybe many of these will prove to be successful because <clears throat> the scale-up problem at the end of this is, is a serious problem. We need to be able to make, I don't know how many millions of doses of this vaccine available as quickly as we can. And the best way for that to happen is if the, you have more than one vaccine being produced at large scale by one company or one entity. So hopefully we'll come up with a number of different vaccines, all of them effective, and we'll be able to produce those in a large enough scale so that we can protect ourselves this coming fall when, uh, when they say that the coronavirus may come back again along with the flu. Hi there. Mark here, a colleague of Dr. Tim Herman's. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out our other coronavirus resources available at www.3dmoleculardesigns.com slash scienceofcoronaviruses.htm, including a paper modeling activity where you can create your own physical model of a coronavirus. We hope you enjoy, and thanks.